Atmosphere for learning and connecting. I have a couple of my organizers with me tonight. This is Trisha McTeeter. Uh, she's going to be emceeing tonight um, and she's come on to help me with this event and I'm so happy. And also Lily in the back. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce the last name. Serfati. And she's helping me with the tech talks. We had our first one last week at Spreadfast. Uh, if you don't know what those are, they're the fourth week of the month. We just added them last month. It's a 45 minute talk, a uh, technical talk on different topics at different companies. So it's gonna change each month where we are. And it's great for you to, to learn about local tech companies and some of the awesome things that they're doing. This month we're gonna be at Lithium and they also do social analytics. So we'll have their, their uh, view of social analytics. Cool. Uh, tonight's event is Lightning Talks. So we have four people who are going to give five to ten minutes, um, maybe longer, depending on how much time we have, and if you all don't fall asleep. Uh, talks. And we're going to start uh, with, I think, Allie, and mm -hmm. Trisha's going to introduce the speakers for us. Yep. So uh, we've got more talks lined up tonight. Um, Allie's going to start us off. She's going to talk about Girl Connect Codes. Um, it's a mentorship program uh, for young girls and how you can get involved in that. Um, and then after that, we're going to have Natalia, who's going to talk about sex. Um, and Holly is going to give a talk on Do It Scared. Um, that's her foray into the tech industry. Um, and then we're going to finish with Nola, uh, and she's going to do closure for programmers. So let's get started. Thank you. Hello, I'm Allie. Uh, I don't think I'm going to take anywhere close to 10 minutes, but I work for Jen Austin. Has anybody heard of Jen Austin before? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yay, yay, good. Every self when I ask that, it's just blank stares, so it's nice to see people that know about it. So Jen Austin is a nonprofit um, in Austin, Texas. Uh, we stand for the Girls Empowerment Network of Austin, so we do all kinds of different programming for girls in Central Texas. We go all the way down to third grade up to 12th grade um, through various programs like all the school clubs, the workshops. Uh, we have our conference every November where thousands of girls, the last time we had almost 2,000 girls and parents come and learn about a bunch of different various girl related topics. Um, but I work with um, Girl Connect, and so that is our technology kind of focused, I guess, initiative that we now started at Jen Austin. And the biggest project happening with it is called Girl Connect Codes. So that's kind of been my little baby um, since we got the grant to put it together. And it's now turned into this awesome 12 week program for girls in high school, and we're starting with Crockett High School. If y'all are familiar with Crockett, we have a group of 12 high school girls that have signed up for this program voluntarily, which is great, so they're really excited. Um, and we are kind of teaching them the quickest snapshot we can of intro to web development, and then at the other end of the program, they're going to be creating a website for girls. So the first half of the program is teaching them about what web development is, the opportunities they have in it. So we're gonna have a, two different career panels, one at the beginning, one at the end, um, and they're going to learn a little bit about HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and then we're going to have a workshop by a group of IBM women that are going to come talk about design, which is really exciting. And then the whole second half of the program, after they've kind of 
understood what goes into building a website, they're going to build one. So we're going to work together as a team to kind of research what girls' websites are currently out there, what they like about them, what they don't like about them, and then we're going to work together to create a website for girls built by girls. And they're taking the lead on that. Um, so we're really looking for mentors, so someone that could be there every single week. We meet on Thursdays from 4.30 to 6.30. And so far, I think we have four, but we have 12 girls, so the more help, the better. Um, so I'd love to talk to anybody who's interested. It's pretty relaxed. You just kind of show up, help in ways you can. If you want to take more of a leadership role, we definitely encourage that as well. Um, but I'm just out here trying to see if people are interested and kind of how they can get involved. Now, Ali, if, um, <laughs> if anybody can't uh, dedicate the full 12 weeks, or is there some flexibility in that? Are there other options if people do want to get involved? Yes, there's a possibility of every other week. We start with asking every week just to keep consistency for the girls so that they can feel that connection with whoever, whoever is working with them. But we are flexible with every other week. Anything other than that, I think maybe, hopefully we can involve you in the next kind of installments of that. But we want the girls to feel really close with the women that, are, that they're working with every week. And do you have something you can pass out to I you? do. I have flyers right here. It has, let's see, I did forget to put that it's a Crockett. It's a Crockett High School. Um, so if you have questions about it, my phone number's on it, my email's on it. And it also has the time and dates. Our first day was last Thursday. So we got to meet the girls. We got to kind of do some icebreakers, getting to know them. And so this week we're diving into the career panel. So, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, how long did you say it was? It's 12 weeks. Okay, so like a semester or? Pretty much to the end of the semester. The last day is the 23rd of April. Do you have any more questions? Where is Crockett? Crockett is on Manchac and Stasky, so South Boston. Thank you. Anyone else? That is so much. <laughs> I feel like it's really quick, but no, that was great. Lots of info. Yes, next up we have Natalia <coughs> on sassy variables, practical color theory. So I might be reading too much, but um, I actually wrote this out as a blog post. So if you see me looking this way, look really disinterested, and then I'll come right back into the more speaking kind of engagement. So, what I would really like to do is talk a little bit about practical color theory. Um, if you've ever described code as being elegant, or if you've ever thought like, wow, the patterns emerging are just so unbelievable and so cool, um, you're probably someone who would really enjoy diving into color theory. Unfortunately, despite the overwhelming interest that I see a lot of people have in being a master of color and shade and tint and everything, um, color theory resources tend to live in that tab behind the other tab that's totally next to the tab of the thing you'll get to eventually at some point next week, you promise, and then your computer, you restart it, and you never ever actually look at it. Um, so I'm here to tell you that it's really, really great and maybe just bring some things across from that um, thanks to four years of art school um, I can share with you. Um, <laughs> so if you do ever manage to click on one of those resources that you might find out there for color theory, um, you might back right back out when you read it. Um, there are three terrible guesses that I have for why this might happen. Um, one is the outdated naming conventions that they have for the art resources that have been you know, invented in the 1800s. Um, yes, those names are inherited from the guys who had to grind the pigment and into the paste for their canvases, but thalo cyanide blue doesn't mean anything to anyone. And ivory black is not even semantic. So um, two, spotty documentation. How many of you guys ever had a color wheel in your classroom somewhere in school? Do you guys know that it's actually a map that you should actually have instructions to how to read it and navigate across it? It's not just like telling you, look at all these colors arranged nicely in a circle. It's actually a useful tool, but somehow that just doesn't, yeah, you know, nobody did the documentation for it. And then of course, legacy systems. If you get a really good resource 
um, odds are it's going to also tell you that this resource is best used with a stick with some hair on the end of it, and you must use that stick with hair on the end of it to smear goop on canvas. And that might not translate to you that day if you've got to actually pick the colors for your website and you're not using an easel and painting on canvas with a paintbrush. That was a paintbrush I was describing. <laughs> or, um, so, um, so it's very clear that a lot of the best resources that I encountered when I was in art school, I hate saying it like that, when I was in school for art, um, they didn't, they didn't actually make it across the digital divide. And if they have, a lot of the stuff out there is like, use this, like this, but it never really, like, why? And it feels so random and so haphazard, like, it's like fashion sense, you know, you're like, it just seems like some people have it, some people don't, I'll just like, wear whatever everybody else is wearing and, you know, steal colors and color pick from somebody else's site and raise your hand if you're guilty of just color picking from someone else's site. So my whole point of coming here and doing this probably slightly long talk, um, lightning talk on color and sassy stuff, is to just make you feel a little more confident using the awesome tool we all have now, which is SAS, um, and, and kind of like getting you comfortable into thinking about like, well, you can pick colors and you can be pretty confident using them and you know coming up with designs without having to just pick at random or even more spark coated. Um, so I've mixed a lot of paint and I've learned a lot of stuff, so I'm gonna give you some really unsolicited advice about <laughs> Just some of the random knowledge that's rolling around in my head about the whys and also just how I've applied it in my own um, SAS partials and writing, you know, here's my code. So one is you really want to limit your cues. What do I mean by that? Pick one color to start. Maybe if you go crazy, two. And if you remember that crazy color wheel that you had, pick two colors across from each other on the color wheel and that's about as complicated as it should get. You don't want to start picking colors and then, ooh, that one looks good and that one looks good. Before you know it, everything's going to go crazy because color theory is the original design pattern for visual stuff. Um, visual experience engineer was actually coined like in the 80s by someone um, whose name I don't remember right now. But I'm also not sure he really coined it. So I'm not going to give him credit right then. But basically, um, it's, it's actually a pretty complicated bit, bit of pattern where colors interact with each other and they interfere with each other and it's just like when you write code you don't just like start throwing functions all over the place and doing whatever it kind of like works like that with color theory as well you want to make sure it's well architected and future friendly and so this is what this is all about um color isn't just the only thing you get to choose there are all these things like luminosity saturation tint shade opacity i'm sure if you've ever touched css you've seen some of those, especially in SAS, you've seen some of those kind of just, that's a thing you could do, and then you might not use it. Um, those are just as important, and if not more important, than picking a good color like mine. Anybody, you can just kind of type at random. Just put that symbol and just type at random, and it'll be a color. But learning how to uh, use all of the different tools available in terms of color, it's not just important for, um, it looking good. It's really important for accessibility. So for example, I'm just going to rant off a little bit of knowledge that's rolling around in my head. Things that you learn from the world, from seeing good design, from seeing good designers, because you don't have to go to art school to all of a sudden be able to do this. Good designs all around you and you can kind of learn. Like These have been intentional decisions that designers have made. You can learn from them. So um, one is, what's the most, actually, what's the most noticeable color that you, that the human eye can notice? Think traffic cones, think emergency vests. It's orange, right? And all of a sudden you're like, hey, I just kind of start connecting that. Um, what about you know the, the crazy advance of the minimalist design that Apple did? Um, that's one of the things you can learn. Uh, you need at least 30% of your view area to be neutral colors like white, or, you know, black or gray, for all of your colors to stop clashing so hard. Um, and the more white space, the better. Really, that's that's one of the easiest things you can do, is if you want to make any piece of art look better, put a bunch of white space around it and another big frame and give it some room to breathe. Um, your, the color that you perceive something is depends on the color that's right next to it. That's a tough one to figure out, but it's a lot of fun to play with. You're basically a magician playing with optical illusions at that point, which I think is a lot of fun. Um, you can make uh, 
Oh, this is a better one. Uh, people perceive cool colors to be further back than warm colors. So if you're actually designing on this flat surface that looks like a computer screen, you're actually messing with depth there. So things like a blue will be perceived as being further behind an orange. So that's, that's a need to know. Um, and then if you mix two opposite colors like orange and blue together, what does that do? Brown? just grays it out into completely nothing. It cancels, it's, they cancel each other out. So that's really interesting. And the gray that it does make is actually a really perfect neutral complement because there's warm grays and cool grays. And that's a whole other rabbit hole that I can talk about. Um, but speaking of grays, uh, I use gray instead of pure black. Pure black's really not found in nature, really. It's always like some off gray. And that's why both in painting and web design, you don't want to just go ahead and just use pure black. Hope somebody told you that, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's some things that some people just kind of discover on their own after trying things and trying them again. Um, and then color palette wise in general, um, it seems to be the trend that the older you are, the more of a sophisticated and muted palette you like. So that's why you see a lot of things aimed at children being very primary bright colors. And I am coming to terms with the fact that I really love beige. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then, you know, in general, too, if it works in black and white, then it almost doesn't matter what color it is, because more important than what a color it is, is the contrast. If you take all of the color information out, say you're completely colorblind, not just red, green, not, you know, you can't see color, uh, it's really important for accessibility. You want to make sure that there's enough contrast, or they call it value, too, when if somebody can't see color, they can still use your website. Um, one terrible example I've seen and actually kind of collect these is there was a, a coffee shop sign that was green paint on a red background. And if you actually took a picture of it in black and white, the exact number of light photons are bouncing off both of them so that if it was a colorblind person who didn't see any color, they would just see a blank gray wall. So um, those are the kind of just like these random bits of knowledge that are floating around in my head after doing a lot of color theory and doing a lot of color stuff. So how do you just kind of tie it all together instead of making it seem just kind of a lot scarier than it should be? Great, you can mess up in all these ways. Um, well, because it's actually pretty cool how complex and exciting it is and how easy it is to keep it simple. The secret is stop picking colors. Just stop going crazy with the color picker and adding more neat colors that look really great. If anybody's ever painted a, a room in a house or a couple of rooms and you go to the store and you're just picking out swatches and then you actually go to the actually paint it and it looks terrible because it's next to this other one that looks terrible and you should have just left the whole thing beige. Um, so here's an example and if you could scroll for me slightly. I left the laptop right there. Oh great, wow, thank you. So if you've used um, CSS and then have started using SAS, you've noticed that you don't have to hard code colors and you can put assign variables to have a color. And that's really great, but a lot of times what happens is people go, great, I'm just gonna throw, everything is, you know, yellow, and you hard code that all over your code. And then when you wanna change it from yellow to green, you go and you control F and find all the places you said yellow and change it again. And that's just not okay. Um, so what I really like to do is you pick a really simple color palette, and this is just like my default. I like blue and I like orange. In fact, if you ever want to see a really effective color palette, um, blue and orange, look at any action movie poster ever. Mm -hmm. If it's not a very good movie, it's probably always gonna be a diagonal to imply action, and it's gonna have a blue and orange fade. I've ruined all posters for you. Um, <laughs> so you know, you can, you, you can pick your color palette, your white, gray, you know, neutral, whatever, but this is how I do my color scheme. And this is for a very simple, just complimentary thing. I'll say my pri primary color is blue, right here, <coughs> right? So it's, I pick this blue, I abstract it away into just a nice readable variable. Um, and then I say primary color is blue. And then the dark version of that, the light version of that, a more neutral version, grayed out version of that, a much more saturated chromatic version of that. Um, I can just assign those variables and use SAS functions to just go ahead and tweak it right there. Um, and this one, the last one, Adjust Hue, I really love too, because remember that color wheel that nobody cares about in school? Well, when you say adjust your primary color by 20%, you mean 20% on that color wheel, the circle. If anybody remembers their math, 
then you can just go ahead and use that right here. Um, the same thing for an accent color. I've decided my accent color is orange, and then you can just go ahead and use the SAS variables, uh, the SAS functions to lighten, darken, desaturate, saturate your orange, and um, you can even go ahead and assign different, you know, font colors there too. But what happens if my client says, blue and orange are out, I want red and green, it is red and green all the way. All I have to do is just go ahead and change my, my primary color and my accent color, that's it. Um, one of the reasons though I really do like assigning a color palette up here, uh, and, and I just like abstracting away, I don't like, I can't really, except for black and white, I can't really tell what color something is just by the, the hex code. Um, so just to kind of sum it up, you're pretty much okay picking colors. If you just pick one, two, or three, three really, if just you really know what you're doing, um, kind of at opposite ends of the color wheel. So you get on a triangle right across from each other or just pick one and then just tweak them with some functions and let it kind of do its own thing. You'll get color harmony. You'll get colors that really complement each other and they won't constantly fight. And if you just throw a bunch of neutral col colors all around it, like a nice white, gray, brown, tan, beige, um, it, it's probably just gonna work. And that's the most reassuring thing about color theory is once you get over the whole like, oh my God, are my colors gonna match? What's it gonna look like? I just should just leave this to a designer or somebody who knows. Once you kind of learn those patterns of, well, there's just a few really nice rules Stick to a small color palette and tweak from there, add white, add gray to a color, you know, use the functions that SAS has right there built in for you. It's just gonna work and it's gonna look pretty good. And it's gonna be pretty good for accessibility as well um, for people who don't see color or are low vision. And that's my giant long spiel. Please open that tab for color theory. It's really great. <laughs> that you, you said blue and orange because that's kind of the colors of the startup I work for, but, but I've named them sapphire and goldenrod. Completely <laughs> <laughs> different. So I, I would repeat it to see like what color it matched. Um, so that was our first two speakers. We have two more. Uh, we can take a five minute break for bathrooms if anyone needs to use the restroom. I hope you all drink a lot of wine. So then you might be great. <laughs> but um, I want to introduce our sponsor. Hip Chat is a long-term sponsor, our very first, and they're sponsoring this meetup for six months. It's really exciting. Today we have Lauren McElhoney with us, and she's an engineer on the Hip Chat team. You want to take two minutes and tell them what Hip Chat is? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, so Hip Chat is a collaboration tool or a chat client, whichever you prefer. Um, and it's, you can like that. It's for team buddies. collaboration, right? Team collaboration, yes. We have a lot of, like everybody is remote um, where I work. Like our, the people who work on the Windows and Linux client are all around the world. Like no, one, no person, no one from that team is in the same city as another person from that team. Um, so it's really good for stuff like that. And, Oh, y'all should check it out. <laughs> it's free or two dollars a user, so it's good. Cool. And I love working there. Great. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, some people came oh, there. Is. So why don't we take a five-minute break so more people can tacos and wine, and then we're gonna have Nola next with closure um, at seven forty. So you have four minutes. <laughs> Don't all run to the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have a little bit of similar I'm <laughs> 
Functional, just so Ruby is object oriented, but it could have some functional aspects to it. It's a little bit different in that, that respect, and that's what kind of made me be like, hmm, I'll try something different just to give myself a break. And it's designed by programmers, which is Rich, Rich Hickey. He designed it for programmers. It's not really designed to be like beginner, teach me, teach me a code language, because it's just, it's not that hard to understand, I think. So it's really made for programmers to to use. Um, the syntax is uh, very small compared to Ruby, probably, and a lot of languages. Um, there's a keyword which is, looks like a symbol in Ruby with, 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 the, uh, with the colon, uh, and there's a symbol which is either kind of like reverse in Ruby, which is kind of weird at first for me. Uh, symbol is any word, like any function, any variable, that's called a symbol. 
the string of courses with the quotes. Actually, it should be single quotes, not double quotes. No, it's double quotes. Um, and injures just course numbers. Those are pretty much your syntax. Uh, the data structures are a vector, the square brackets, and then there's a. Let's add this the wrong one. So I see the next one on my tablet, and then the current one that's up there. So in closure, everything is a list, which is with parentheses. Um, so a function is defined as a function name, parameter, parameter, but it's all in um, parentheses. What normally you might say function name, parentheses, you know, variable, parentheses. So it's kind of a little bit reversed. So an example, uh, to print hello world, you put parentheses on both sides, then you print the name of the function, and then there's, there's a string. And what's cool is the plus operator is actually a function. So you put that in the first place, the function place, and then you have the parameters, and you could have like plus one, two, three, four, five, you can do you know, multiple um, parameters. And then here is the data structure, which is only three. So we have vector with the square brackets, and then a map or a hash is with the curly braces. And you would think uh, you need to put a comma between them, but you don't because comma is considered white space enclosure. So it's weird at first, but once you get the hang of it, you know, you're like, oh, I don't really need no commas in there. And a set is braces, but it has a hashtag in front and that has to be a unique collection. So before you think, oh, I want all those parentheses, if you look at the Ruby code, which is white and I do mostly is, uh, here is the first one. I have a fun define a function called say what, and then you put, put the string, and then the last line is how you use a function. In closure, um, the function is called defin for define function, and you put the name of the function followed by the, the parameters, which could be empty. If you have no parameters, you just close up and be, have two empty braces. If you have a parameter, you put them inside, and then you call println with the name of the function, and to print two values in a row, you just put them one after the other. So I say is one string followed by the the verbal what, which just got passed in. And it's called pretty much the same as it's Ruby, just the prints are on the outside. So one of the cool things about Clojure that I really like is called nREPL. So if you ever use uh, Ruby and you use IRB or Pry, type code in and try stuff, um, Python has a REPL. Uh, PHP maybe does, but it's not as common. Um, and then JavaScript kind of does if you can do it in your browser or with or with Node. You can do kind of a REPL type thing with that. But with the uh, closure, you can have your, your editors pull out your code into REPL so you can type it with functions and try to experiment with that. And they call that REPL driven development. And uh, once you get the hang of it, you know, it's really cool. So you might think, uh, all right, so uh, what's it good for? It's might be kind of small. I should have, uh, I forgot how to make my font bigger. So the first one is a called OM, O-M, and it's a wrapper around Facebook's React library. You probably heard about that. It's getting really popular now, like, oh, this is so cool, so cool, so cool, and exciting. <laughs> um, but OM is a wrapper around it, and it's equally exciting in Clojure actually works better in Clojure. It's even faster Clojure than in JavaScript because uh, Clojure is immutable, so it's it's uh, a natural for, for OM. Uh, there's a library called Composure, which is for, for websites. And if you've done Ruby, um, it's like Rack, your basic, you know, kind, kind of like Sinatra, your basic, you know, web app um, with controllers <coughs> and views. And Korma is an ORM, and uh, it's pretty cool. I've been using that, and that's really cool. There's a 
play CLI, there's a wrapper around libgdk, you know, G, gdx, it's a game library, and you can use that to make games, which is really cool. Um, it does a desktop mobile apps, and it's really neat. There's a, a library called Quill, which takes graphics and animations. Uh, Synaptic does neural networks. Uh, Castalog is a query language for Hadoop. So if you're into big data, um, it's a wrapper around, there's a Java library called uh, Castalog, so it's a, it's a wrapper around that. And then there's Datomic, which is a database which is uh, separates storage from queries and it runs on top of a database. And people who do closure uh, use that a lot because it has a lot of same characteristics as closure, which is made by the same guy. So uh, I wanted to talk about closure a little bit because we're going to be doing a closure bridge workshop uh, in March. It's kind of like Rails Bridge, if you've uh, done that. Um, so it's, it's a Friday night install fest and Saturday, you know, we we'll do the workshop. Uh, it's going to be March 13th and 14th, which is actually kind of by during South by, but it's going to be up north to hopefully be in uh, Escape the Madness uh, at Rexface. Uh, so we're getting sponsors to pay for the food, and uh, we're actually flying in Bridget Hilliard, who did the first couple closure bridge. So you're gonna fly in and help teach it. She said she's gonna make me do some, but we'll see about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> so a few resources, and I'll put these slides up on uh, as PDF, and I'll post it as a comment to the meetup. Is uh, there's a, there's a few books that are really good, and we're gonna actually give away some of the books at the, at the workshop. And there's some videos that are really good to watch. You can just search for them. I could put the links on them, but they're so long and ugly. I'm like, eh, you can just search for that as a title, and you can find it. Um, so, uh, I'm, I made the registrations for Closure Bridge to start today, if you wanna sign up. We're limiting it to 20. So if you're not sure you want to do it, you know, you can think about it a little bit. Well, and we'll probably do another one soon. Um, but probably it's going to be good for someone who's done more programming, a little bit like uh, like Ruby or Ruby, Ruby or Python or PHP for maybe six months at least. So you can, you can really grasp the concepts easy. Um. <coughs> <coughs> Any questions? Is there a cost to the workshop? It's free. Okay. For the sponsors that pay for it. Um, how familiar with Clojure should one be before this workshop? You don't need to be familiar with Clojure, just basic programming concepts so that you're not wondering, oh, what would I use a loop for? What is, you know, if statement? Um, the other closure bridge has been for people who didn't even know programming, and it was a little bit hard. So I'm like, yeah, I think it'd be a lot easier for someone, not so discouraging. If you get your parentheses out of line, then it's pretty frustrating. But you know, once you you know are playing programming, then uh, it, it's really fun. It's it's like that's all you need to do. It's easy. You're like whoa, you know, it's 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 really fun. Cool. And it's kind of new language. I think I didn't put the year on it, but I think it's like three years old. Uh, 2007, uh, I think you had on one of the slides oh, okay. for when it was created. Yeah, so five, no, seven years? Yeah. So, kind of new compared to uh, Ruby. So, it seems a bit more exciting, like, you can experiment. New, maybe this is a library you want to build that somebody hasn't already built. Like, Ruby, I mean, this library does, and like, oh, it's already five of them, so. <laughs> Uh, and the closure, the closure meeting, which is on May uh, second Monday, so a week from today, uh, they are super nice, super nice, helpful people. So it was really, <coughs> I tried learning, learning scholar for a while, but the community wasn't there. There was no nice people I could find, so 
hey, people want to help you, I think is a good uh, sign that it's a good language to learn. Can you explain what immutable is? Because you were saying a few times that closure is immutable. Yeah, so immutable means it doesn't change. So if you define a variable called my name is Nola, and if you change, you, you can't change Nola, but you can change what that variable points to. So in Java, in Java, strings are immutable. If you want a new string, you can make a new a new object. Um, so for objects that are in uh, with a concurrency with multiple threads, changing or reading reading things, you don't want things to be changing underneath of you. So immutable data structures are good for concurrency. And that's uh, one of the things that React is about updating the, the DOM. It checks to see if things have been changed. So that's one, I haven't really quite understood exactly how to do it, but that's one of the things but with React is having immutable things. Yeah. And closure. These are immutable. You can't edit them. Yeah. You can only delete them. So that's why Twitter can be so fast on indexing because it knows it's never going to change. Mm -hmm. If anyone wants to look at Clojure and see more of its syntax, you can go on codecombat.com and play as a wizard using Clojure, or Ruby, or JavaScript, or Python, or much of other stuff. But Clojure's on there. Codecombat.com. It's a lot of fun. It starts off really easy, and then you have to get harder to catch yourselves. <laughs> Off with Holly. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna talk on Do It Scared. Her forays into the dance yes. industry. She survived. Sit down. <laughs> I've programmed all day. I tweaked yesterday. And sent you all emails. Um, so my talk is Do It Scared, and it's my journey into the tech industry. It's a uh, I'm supposed to encourage all of you who want to get into the tech industry and, and think it's too hard because you don't have a computer science degree or you're not even sure if you like programming and you don't know what these words are that everyone's been talking about today, variables and immutable and threads and concurrency and all of that other stuff. So to help you feel better about yourselves, I'm going to tell you how awful my experience was. And yours will be so much more amazing. <laughs> so, two and a half years ago, before I came to Austin, I had a mental breakdown. I was working at a nonprofit for kids with disabilities, and I ran summer camps and uh, camps for wounded warriors. And it was awesome and a lot of fun and a lot of work. And I'm a type A person, and I overwork and burn out. So, I was. Um, trying to go on a juice fast three weeks before the camp because I'm crazy. And I thought, you know, why not? I'm a bigger achiever. I want to look in my bathing suit. I can do this. But I didn't know that my body doesn't react well to uh, acidic foods. And I was having a lemon a day in my smoothie with, with the rind to get all that benefit. And um, it just gave me a chemical imbalance and I I ended up having a mental breakdown and going to the hospital for a week and missed the summer camp and then ended up losing my job as well. And that sent me into this really dark depression downspin because it was my whole life. I tend to be an all or nothing person and so I gave my all, I wanted to work there the rest of my life and I just, I had no future anymore, no goals and all of my friends were there, everything was there, and I felt like I really had nothing to live for. Thankfully, I had a husband, so he helped me. <laughs> he would drive me out of bed and throw me in the shower, because I would just stay in bed all day if I could. Uh, he was preparing to come here to Austin to do an MBA. I didn't want to move to Austin. Didn't even know where it was. Heard it was in Texas, so I didn't want to move. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Los Angeles, so I was like, Texas. Um, but now that I had no job, and no plans, you know, it's like, why not? I'll go with you to Austin. Uh, but it was, it was very anxious for me, and I threw up every morning for the whole month before we moved because I just, I couldn't understand how am I going to move to Austin 
because I, I've never lived anywhere outside of Los Angeles, and in the mental state that I was in, because I was still recovering, I was like, how do people find a new bait? How do you find groceries? Like, how do people do this? You know, I had Whole Foods and Trader Joe's within half a mile from my house. You know, I had everything I needed. So I was like, how do people uproot themselves and move? I didn't know anyone in Texas. I didn't want to move to Texas. I didn't know how good the tacos were. Easier. <laughs> but um, and we had to give away all of our stuff because we didn't know if we were going to stay or not. His program was only six months on ground. So I didn't know where we were going after that. He wanted to go to Chicago or New York or somewhere. I wanted to get away from big cities. So Austin has been a nice place because it's not as big as Los Angeles. So we sold all of our furniture and packed up our car and drove here in two days in the middle of the only freak snowstorm Texas has ever had. <laughs> so that was fun. But we got here and um, I still was depressed because I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And I was jealous of my husband because he had a plan. He was doing yeah. an MBA and knew what he was wanting to do. And I was like, it's so easy for you. You can't tell me, like, I need to not be depressed because everything's perfect for you. <laughs> and I'm here, you know, doing all the laundry and grocery shopping to keep you alive. And <laughs> <laughs> But um, I really am grateful for him because he would drive me out of bed and say, you have to get up. You know, I can't come home to you crying in bed. And I left with you crying in bed. So he found a, a place for me to volunteer in town, an art studio with uh, this, uh, artists with disabilities, which is my passion. So uh, I started volunteering there twice a week, and I really recommend it to people who are depressed, get out of your house. If you stay and isolate yourself, it's only going to get worse, it's just going to get darker. So find something to do that has meaning. So that helped, but I, I still was depressed because I'm a goal-oriented person and I had no goal. So about halfway through his six month program, he heard about Maker Square, which is a 10 week boot camp here in Austin for Ruby on Rails. And he'd been looking at different boot camps in Chicago, New York, because he wanted to go into the tech industry. And I thought maybe I could find a job or something. And now that I was doing art, I was like, maybe I'll be an art therapist. And so I was like looking at masters of art therapy and stuff, because you know I'm a planner, I'm goal oriented. So I'm like, I gotta find something to make me happy. So when he found Maker Square and it was here in town, I was like, well, we don't have to move. And I think we have enough finances to last through the summer. We could do it together. I actually had studied web design in school, but I didn't really know the programming back end. I did stuff with Dreamweaver, which all of you know vomits code. Yeah. So <laughs> it's really bad. So I was like, well, this would be cool. I've never even heard of Ruby on Rails. You know, this sounds fun. And I did some Code Academy stuff, but uh, it, it still was hard because I hadn't been using really my brain, my analytical skills for six months. And so even doing Code Academy was hard for me. I was like, I don't know if I can do a 10 week class. And then uh, a couple weeks into the class, I found out that I actually had food allergy that I was allergic to soy and of wheat and also had intolerances to like 40 other things because of um, my allergies, and that was one of the reasons I had my, my mental breakdown. Um, and so in Maker Square, I had to rotate my food every day. I could have like three foods, broccoli and beef, and the next day, cucumbers and chicken, and the next day, fish and lettuce. And so that was really hard because I had to go home and make my food every night for the next day. And they were bringing in pizza and tacos <laughs> and barbecue, and I love barbecue. So I would probably stay in Austin, hopefully the rest of my life, because I love barbecue. So that was really hard. And we were also biking to class because we wanted to save money on parking downtown. So we were biking four miles a day in 110 degrees. So I got heat rash. So every day I felt like fire ants falling over me. And I can't eat, I can't drink coffee, and I'm pissed off at everyone. And they all are smarter than me because I haven't been using my brain. And I'm a, I'm a 4.0 student, and it was just really hard to be like, I'm the stupidest person in the room. You know, everyone else is getting this, and I'm only understanding half of what they're talking about, maybe. And and all of my stuff sucks because I don't know this SAS and color theory and <laughs> flat design and 
you know, they find all these cool plugins. I go home, I want to sleep. You know, other people want to stay up all night and get four hours of sleep. I don't know, I need eight hours. You know, I'm grumpy. I'm going to bite your head off. So, <laughs> leave me alone. Um, and it was really hard. And then there's also the fears. You know, like, am I going to get a job out of this? Will we have enough money, you know, to last us through the summer? I've used up all of my my unemployment and you know it's just watching you know the bank account go down and we had one credit card we're using for groceries but that was going to get close to being maxed out and i was like what if i what if my final project sucks you know all these other people are smarter than me and everything i've done just looks kind of crappy and i don't think i'm going to be able to find a job so my husband was very encouraging because he um did some exercises in his mba called uh, deconstructing your fear so he'd say to me okay let's deconstruct your fear what are you afraid of well I'm afraid I, I'm, I'm not gonna get a job he goes well what's the worst thing that can happen if you don't get a job and I said we're homeless <laughs> probably he'll get a job but I'm just like worst thing we're homeless and he's like okay what would we do if we're homeless like pack our car and drive back to Los Angeles move in with our parents probably so even even with the worst thing like we weren't really going to be homeless. Like, there was a solution. And then he said, well, if we did move back to Los Angeles and move with my parents, you know, how long would it take for you to find a job? And I said, I don't know, maybe four months, six months. And he said, you know, do you think they wouldn't help us for that time? I said, probably. So, so your fear is really not that big. And so we had to do that over and over because every time there'd be something else I'm afraid of. You know, I don't know how to do interviews. He's like, okay, well, what can we do about that? You know, are there tech recruiters we can talk to who can encourage you on interviews? You know, are there certain companies you are looking at? You know, MakerSquare actually has a placement office, and so they try to help you, you know, encourage you and give you tips for interviewing and set up the interviews for you. So, I mean, they, they are good, um, mostly good in that area. <laughs> Uh, I'm smiling because there's a few <laughs> square guys here, so they know nobody's perfect. They're pretty good. Um, so you know there there were all those fears, and um, I made it through the program. I did my final project with my husband. I don't think it was the coolest, but I actually had something for my portfolio, and I think that's all you need. And then uh, I, I met my current boss at uh, Austin on Rails, a meetup because I was leading a panel, because that was one thing. I was like, I gotta get my name out there. I gotta get out there. So anything I could do, I'd volunteer. I mean, I, I started this woman who code in the middle of this horrible experience. So I'll tell you how crazy I am. <laughs> um, but I love doing this. And so I met my boss at a meetup. I was leading a panel for women, and she said, I'm looking for a Ruby on Rails developer. And I said, I'm looking for a job. And I was hired. And so that was awesome. It's like, okay, that fear, wasn't really that real. Like I found a job within three weeks of graduating. And and the worry about finances, the first day I got paid, our bank account was only three hundred dollars. And I got the check and I went in the bathroom and cried because I was like, we we're gonna be okay. We have enough. But even even my job wasn't perfect. I was working at a startup as the only developer in a language I had just learned in 10 weeks. <laughs> and, and, and it was built by Siberian programmers. <laughs> Brilliant, but wrote stuff in Russian. You know, and I could understand when I asked them questions. And my boss was an insane attorney lady who, you know, didn't like when I went to the bathroom because I was taking too many breaks. And so even, even with my job, I think I spent nine months of just being afraid because uh, I have no clue what I'm doing. Everything's over my head. My boss is weird and crazy. <laughs> and, you know, what do I do? So I started looking for people to mentor me. I went to as many meetups as I could. Uh, when people talked about stuff that I thought was interesting and they seemed to be smart, I'd go ask them lots of questions. And some of them said, you know, let's meet at a coffee shop. I'll help you out. And so that turned into me being like, I'll buy you coffee every Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Just explain this code to me because I don't understand it. But still, every time I had a project that was due, I was terrified. You know, I didn't do enough and it wasn't good enough and I should have done it faster. And, you know, everything was so slow for me. Why can't I be faster? And those fears were never valid. You know, my boss always thought 
I was doing fine. She didn't know any better herself. She's not a programmer. So she's just like, you wrote code, great, you know? But maybe we could do it a little faster, but you're a beginner, I know that. And so I, I had a little bit you know, of leverage because she's paying me half what a senior person would be. So if she fired me, she'd have to hire you know, two of me. So <laughs> you know, it's a good deal, but still, I had that terror in my mind. And my husband had to say like, you know, you're not gonna lose your job. Jackie would be crazy. She can't replace you. You know, no one else would deal with her shit. You know, so. <laughs> but still there was that fear, like I'm not good enough, I'm new, I'm never gonna be good enough. And it stayed, it stayed for a long time and I'd have to fight it every day until the summer. I was on vacation in Finland with my husband and our server got hacked. And I had to rebuild it from a cabin in Finland with Google, because I didn't know anything about servers. And I did it. And when I came home, I was like, I'm a programmer. <laughs> <laughs> I rebuilt the server from Finland. As long as I can Google stuff and read Stack Overflow, I can figure out anything. And after that, I wasn't afraid anymore. And so that's my story. <laughs> I still work there. <laughs> does that same boss still work there? She does, but she's changed because after six months, I told her she was scary and everyone was leaving because she was scary. <coughs> oh, wow. And she listened to me, and that was why I stayed because she said, I want to change. I want to get better. Because she's like type A, never been married, no pets, nothing, lives, breathes the job, never eats lunch. I don't know if she ever goes to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I was just like, like, you know. And, and because of being in other industries, I think I have a leg up because I've had to develop interpersonal skills, which not all programmers have. <laughs> so I can tell her, like, look, you're not relating, you know, very well to the people. You know, they, they are working because they're passionate. It's an education starter, but you treat us like, we're not valuable you know you're just using us up and burning everyone out and you know we're valuable like we bring skills and talents and stuff so now she loves me because i'm always like you know someone's gonna leave in three weeks if you don't change <laughs> then it happens and then she's like i need to listen to you like tell me these cues tell me i'm like well you talk down to them and they don't like that so <laughs> you know, now we have a good relationship but that took months and there were so many times I wanted to leave. I was like, I, I'm going to go work for a hip chat. You know, they cater <laughs> food every day. They are on the 18th floor of this big building. I'm in a closet, you know. And I turn around and smack the person behind me. And they don't like me food. <laughs> so, but yeah, I'm still there. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> Where were you? When you go that time, like you're on vacation. Finland. I was in Finland in a cabin. Nice. <laughs> in a 3G hotspot. They have great internet over there. <laughs> yes. So for somebody who's like looking to get started in coding, I, I have a, an MIS background, but I'm in more of like I've been in the consulting world. So an SAP, but I was I would like look at their ABAP code, but not like I could read it and I do SQL and, and all that kind of stuff, but. I had a friend tell me, okay, just like get a Mac and start doing Swift. And I'm like, okay. And so I get the Mac and then I'm like, there's a lot of information out there. And you can pay like $5,000 to go to a course and rant some ranch, nerd ranch, whatever. It's <laughs> 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 the beach now. <laughs> yeah. So like, I'm just kind of almost like overwhelmed with the amount of information. And then there's like, you know, Windows just put out some new training stuff today, one month of training. Um, and so it's kind of like overwhelming of like, which way do I go is, you know, objective. Well, then we try the free stuff first, you know, if, if try Windows, the try the free things first, yeah. you know, before paying thousands of dollars. Um, Code Academy is a good place to start, you know, go through some of their classes like HTML or CSS. They also have JavaScript and Ruby. That will just get you familiar with the syntax and explain some things like what are variables, <coughs> what are methods and functions. Um, and then if you want to take a more in-depth class, 
Uh, Skills Crush is a great site. It's actually built by women for women. So I think it's a good place to learn. Their classes are paid, but they're not that expensive. They're not thousands of dollars. Um, Lynda.com also has a lot of great classes. That's with a Y, Lynda. Uh, Coursera has good classes. We have a Python class ourselves that's free. Thank you. Um, at Rackspace, we're in the middle of it, but we're going to restart it in the spring. So, any of you want to learn Python, it's pretty easy. I started it because I wanted to learn Python, so I'm learning pathology at the same time. That class is, uh, the book is online though for free if you want to look at it now. It's called Learn Python the Hard Way. Also comes with videos if you want to pay $30, but the, the book's free. Um, ACC has some classes if you want to take like an academic setting style class. They have a certificate program in Java. So I know some of the women here have been doing that. Um, and that, of course, looks good on a resume. There are local code camps you can look at. A General Assembly came uh, in December and they're offering a scholarship for women, a part scholarship. Austin Coding Academy has a part time program, which you know, doesn't require you to leave your job and ruin your life all day long coding. <laughs> <laughs> but no, boot camps are really good. Like, if you do some of these classes and you decide you do want to go in the industry, I do recommend boot camps because their goal is to get you hired. And if you're wanting to switch careers, that's what you want. Otherwise, um, build up your portfolio and knock on a bunch of doors. Some people, what they do is get a job at a startup as an admin person and then, you know, start dropping hints that they can code and <laughs> take on projects and then hopefully, you know, switch into a coding job. That's not as common though as people who go through boot camps. So, but those are some of the things you can do. Any other questions? Um, if I can add to that, there's also Odin pro the Odin project, which yes. actually leverages a lot of that stuff. And it's like a really nice curriculum if you like need reading material and getting into that. Odin is a free online boot camp. Uh, T H E O D I N P R O J E C T dot com. And it has like reading bits and it has parts where you're going in and going to Code Academy or doing like small projects on like a project tutor. And then it has something that's a little bit more in depth. You can see other people's work, um, collaborate with them. And that's all on GitHub and put your GitHub on your resume. Yeah. Yes. Another good thing you can do is, is volunteer. You don't have to be an expert to help out with girls. Trisha did some camps last summer for girls here in uh, Austin, and now she's going to make her spurs boot camp. Um, I mean, you have taken a class in Java. Yeah, I had taken a few classes. I was really looking to build my resume um, in kind uh, of some tech areas, and I was in finance and marketing before, and so I was really looking for any opportunity to build my resume. Um, and, you know, I think when you start out, what you'll uh, quickly realize as you start to get into programming is um, you're, you won't be limited on opportunities. And I say that because if you go and you approach a startup and you say, oh, I'll help you code, I promise you they will give you enough things to do. <laughs> if you're coding for free, um, you won't run out of, uh, out of project operates. You know, you'll get to a point where you have to really narrow that down and decide what you want to work on. Um, but I know one question you had asked was, um, you know, what, what language do I learn? There's so many languages, how do I decide? And what I realized um, is first just learn the basics, learn the foundations of programming. So go through like Code Academy. Um, on Linda, they offer a foundations of programming uh, class where you can just learn what's a variable, what are loops, how do they work, you know? Um, Learn that stuff first, and you can do that in any language, and then decide what you want to work on. So if you feel like you want to build mobile apps, then you know Swift and Objective-C, uh, you know that those are going to be your languages to focus on. If you know you want to be on the web um, and do web apps, you know, then you know Ruby on Rails, um, JavaScript, you know, you're going to look more at web languages. Um, but once you know what type of projects you want to work on, Languages are interchangeable. So, I mean, Kelsey is doing C-sharp. Yes. 
and she uh, went to Maker Square doing Ruby on Rails. Um, you know, that's kind of what happens. Um, you will likely change languages more than once <laughs> in your career. Um, I just wanted to add the, um, the Harvard CS50 class for like your intro CS50. It's actually really entertaining, and even if you don't do any of their code challenges, it's really fun. Mm -hmm. And they have a channel for Roku if anyone has it. It made Roku. me really question this art major that I did before the economy got bad. Like, <laughs> <laughs> art is really cool. <laughs> I know, but it's yeah, really great. Yeah. Um, if you if you find like when you watch that stuff and you kind of get really excited, like when they algorithms. Um, you might think like you may have missed your calling. <laughs> 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 um, it's like the Harvard CS50 class. They have a whole channel where they have like all the yeah. videos and like if you just if you skip that one night yeah. and binge it. Yeah, the professor just is really good. so good. Um, yeah, and they have all the code challenges and chai. Yeah, talking about sources, there's one more uh, which is going on on Coursera right now. It's uh, algorithm design and analysis. They have two parts. It's offered by Stanford. And uh, in the first part, the professor is just going through algorithms. Um, so he's going through sorting algorithms and you know randomized search algorithms. And the second part, we would also be talking about data structures. Now, all the programming assignments that he has is, um, it's independent of any programming language you want to use. So, you know, that might also be a good start. And Chai is also starting RailsBridge. RailsBridge, <laughs> yes. Uh, we'll be starting March 1st. Hey. Uh, we'll be starting March 1st, and I would be sending out information about that shortly. Cool. So, yes. excited about that. Coursera and Linda will also, once you finish a course, um, so Linda's about $25 a month. Coursera, if you decide to do a verified certificate, I think it's $30, 40 yeah. Um, and once you finish, um, they both uh, are connected to LinkedIn's, uh, to LinkedIn's API, and so it will actually post your LinkedIn um, as an educational certificate. And so it's a really nice way to build up your LinkedIn. Um, Without paying a lot of money to yeah. do it. And Coursera also has started offering various specializations mm -hmm. uh, whereby you can also do capstone project in the end, mm -hmm. which you cannot do even if you just have a verified certificate or just a pre course, you can't participate in the capstone project. So that might be one way to go. And their specializations are like $149, and you get like five, six courses and a capstone project, which is pretty good. Thank you. We have one and then one. Oh. <coughs> yeah, I just signed up for a class for ACC uh, Fundamentals, and uh, it's going to be using Python as a language. And I'm just curious about the Python language, where we would see that more and more like Python is used a lot with web. Um, in fact, HipChat uses Python a lot for their their application. It's your primary language. For our back end, yeah. all of our back end stuff is in Python and PHP. So it's used a lot. And we're actually looking for a lot of Python developers right now. And they care. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was, I was wondering if anybody had an answer to this question because whenever I was um, studying on my own and I was doing the course online courses and you know wanting to get the certificate, you know I I really wanted to shorten the amount of time that um, I would be able to say that I had developed the skill or and I wanted or I wanted somewhere to say that I was working on the skill. How do you showcase like what you're in the what you're in progress? Well, you can add projects to LinkedIn, um, and so you can say like in progress or something. Okay. And then if you use GitHub to store your projects, you can also link that on on LinkedIn. So that's one place. But you, um, the projects you put on LinkedIn don't necessarily have to be completed. You can just say no. You can link them to if you don't have an actual physical space to link them to, you can actually just link them to your GitHub. Um, so you can link them to the code on your GitHub. Yeah. And the great thing too is, um, what I would encourage everybody to do is add each other on LinkedIn because you can endorse each other. Yeah. Um, and you can also, if you work on projects with each other of any type, you can write recommendations for each other. Um, so you're a collaborator. Mm -hmm. And you can also um, 
uh, tweet about it. And I say that because it's um, if you tweet from, I think, like Free Code Camp or uh, Linda or like Code Academy, they'll actually retweet your stuff. A lot of those guys will. And so it kind of just put your Twitter name out into the Twitter universe. Um, and then you start getting companies who end up connecting with you. And so it's a really nice way to get recognized. Yeah. And all projects start somewhere, so maybe you've only done the first part of the project, but that's still something. You've done mm -hmm. something. Maybe it's only two pages, but if your project was only two pages, you would have finished it. So, you know, there's the, there's the MVP, the minimal viable project, and then there's always more iterations where you add the seat warmers and the auto windows and Bluetooth area. So sometimes you just start with four wheels. Well, can, you, can you tell everybody? Um, what OBE means and how it's helpful to people who are starting out in the programming world because it was really helpful for me. OBE. All right, so a few weeks ago I had lunch with Trisha because they were having a hackathon at Maker Square and all the men gamed up together and the women, four women, were left by themselves and oh thought they were going to lose. So I had lunch with Trisha and I said, Don't worry, you can do it. And they won. Um, so let me because of me. But anyway, I explained to her something my boss had uh, told me. One of my bosses, she was a really great boss, not a crazy boss. And um, I was always worried when I came in with projects that weren't done. You know, I'm kind of a people pleaser, so I was like, oh, he's going to hate me, you know, I'm behind schedule, or, you know, this project's been on our list for six months and we haven't gotten to it. And um, he, he would say, don't worry about it, OBE. And I'm like, what does OBE mean? Well, it's a military term. It means overcome by events. And so when, when you are a, um, a unit, you know, a task unit or whatever, and you have a mission, you know, to take out like a machine gun nest and you're on your way there and you get new intel that the nest is moved or they're gone, they've been destroyed by someone else, you know, you don't complete your mission. You, you change directions, you change courses. So maybe you go that way to, you know, go for this new target. And so when you have to um, report, you know, after your mission, they'll say, you know, well, why, why did you break your orders? Because your orders were to go here. And they would say OBE, overcome by events. So my boss said, you know, we had this mission, you know, to accomplish this project. But then this other project came up. And then this came up. And this and this. And so it was OBE. And I actually told my current boss about this. Because she was like, oh my gosh, we have this one. We have index cards. One of my mentors said, put index cards on the wall so your boss knows how much you're working. <laughs> so we have a whole wall of cards of all the projects she would like to get done one day. And it used to really make me nervous. I'm like, oh my god, how am I going to get all these done? And then a card would sit there for like nine months. And I'd be like, well, really, you know, it's just whatever <coughs> moment is most important. So. As long as I don't stay tied to any of these cards, like I don't really care what <coughs> the project's going. If something's broken, I want it fixed. But otherwise, like I don't care if you want it purple or blue or orange. Um, you know, it's, it's whatever she wants. So I don't I don't <coughs> worry anymore about the cards. You know, I know something else is going to come up and move in front and move in front, and things are going to be overcome by events you know there's deadlines that i used to think were like so set in stone like <coughs> we announced in january this new feature and we're like why did you announce a new feature in january you know and then january comes and she's like oh we really need this i really want that and now it's february and the january thing still hasn't even started and i'm like what maybe it's gonna be a july thing you know i don't care work is getting done and she seems to be happy so it's okay it was a really helpful tool for me because um, when you're when you start to work on projects, I think oftentimes, um, especially if you come from another industry, you are used to kind of getting things done on time, getting emails out on time. Um, and and for everybody, it's very different. You're gonna break more things than you fix. <laughs> so uh, you know, as for me, as I went into this hackathon, um, we had this entire plan laid out of what it was gonna look like. And as we started to go through this, we were going, okay, we've got the smallest group here um, by half the number of people of everybody else. Um, you know, in, in some cases, we may not be as experienced as, as others. Um, well, there was a physicist and a mathematician. Yeah. <laughs> we also know which areas we're stronger in. 
And so we kind of looked at it and we said, you know, the user doesn't know what the user doesn't know. So, um, you know, oftentimes people will go and they'll write this entire back end and nobody will ever see it. And uh, a lot of people approached the hackathon like that and they said, let me make this the most complicated thing in the world and I have to get everything done. And then they didn't end up getting anything done. Yeah. And so by kind of just breaking it down and saying, no, we don't have to get it to this place. We can get it to a smaller place and make it more functional. Um, that's okay too. And so uh, I had lunch with Holly. I walked back in. Uh, my team was kind of frantic, like nobody was eating lunch. Um, I was like, no, we don't have the time. And I come back in, like we have a new strategy. Oh, we, that's what we're doing, okay? <laughs> this is the new direction. What can we get done in 24 hours? And that's what we're gonna do. And so I think when you're, when you're transitioning into programming, when you're working on things, if you do a boot camp any of those things, you know, oftentimes you're going to get stuck in a place and you're going to say, I'm stuck, I was supposed to have this done, I didn't finish this project, um, or I'm just stuck in this area for three days. And sometimes you just have to say, you know what, it's okay, OB, step back. If you have to change directions for a little bit, you do it. Um, and you just don't sweat it. <laughs> yeah. Every, you know, the user doesn't know what the user doesn't know. And so you code for what you can code for, you ask for help for Google on the rest, um, and you know you implement things as you can. Yeah. And sometimes taking a break from the code and coming back later, you, things will click. Like I was revamping our search engine in September, and there were some other projects that were critical, and so I had to put it on hold, and it, it was really bothering me because I couldn't figure out some of the weird voodoo code that the Siberians wrote. And so I was just like, I can't deal with this. They have everything like tangled up, you know, and it's really messy. And then um, I came back to it this month, four months later, and I was like, oh, this is so easy. Like, just need to move this here, move that there. And it's just like everything clicked because it's four months later and I've learned so much in four months because I'm Googling every day. I mean, I learned 30 things every day. And if you like learning, that's one, fun fun part of uh, programming. You know, if you like that rush of learning, that is a lot of fun. So as long as you don't feel like, I don't know anything, I'm an imposter, but just like, you know, this is a learning opportunity. Who I am today is not who I'm gonna be next year or in five years or 10 years. You know, my goal is not to be the best programmer today, it's to be the best programmer in 10 years or 20 years. No more questions? Got a long time. Um, can you elaborate more? You were, you mentioned it earlier. You were saying like going up to companies and say that you'll code for free. Like, were you meaning doing that like as you're kind of learning how to code as a beginner, or like yeah. what did, what were you meaning? Mm -hmm. So one thing I realized um, was that, uh, and and I realized this a little bit through um, Autumn and I both did an apprenticeship with uh, Girls Guild, a startup here in the community. And um, we were really fortunate to kind of just kind of meet those women um, and end up in that opportunity. Um, but one thing I realized through that opportunity and through uh, She Hacks Atex, um, which was last year, which sounds so crazy. It'll um, be coming up again. Uh -huh. Everyone go to it, because yeah. it's a great place to learn a hackathon. You can work on projects. If yeah. you don't know what project to work on, they have projects for you to work on. Even if you don't feel like you know anything, you're like, I have no idea how I can help. I just started. I've only been on Code Academy three times. <laughs> yeah. um, it's OK. And I say that because um, they will place you with the appropriate groups. So. Um, Every, and even if you just want to shadow, yeah. you can always just come, it's free food all the time. Every, every startup has a need, um, and every solution is different, and I say that because Holly and they're all done. startups by women, Yes, and most of them are nonprofits, so mm -hmm. you know you're cooking for a cause, which is mm -hmm. great. Yeah, and I mean, Holly developed a WordPress solution for, for somebody, and that was really the best the solution for that, yeah, for that group, for that business. a website in one day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, so, you know, if you go to those things, if you interact with people at Capital Factory, and I say that because I feel like I just like meet people in the elevator here, and there are a lot of people here with a lot of big ideas um, and nobody to develop for them. Yeah. And I say that because they'll take anything. They're not tech people. I mean, there are a lot of tech people here, but there are also a lot of people who are just like, I have an idea. 
if anybody wants to help me get started, great. Um, and so, yeah. Um, she hacks like ATAX, same thing. Where you're going to find a lot of people who are not technical people, um, but they do have an idea and they're just looking for somebody to help them get started. So even if you don't know a lot, you know more than they know. Um, and because um, they're kind of, you know, they're just they're looking for that help, um, they'll really allow you to kind of take some ownership of the project, help them with the project. Oftentimes you can work out some other terms and conditions with them. Um, but there are a lot of places at these meetups, at hackathons, um, just interacting with people in this space um, where you can find people who are definitely looking for um, anyone who's just willing to help them get their idea on the web. And it will build your portfolio. Mm -hmm. And once you get some experience, you have so many. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. All right. Well, I think that one last child's yeah, last. last question. Um, so, how do you overcome that fear? Like, right now, for me, um, I'm taking a break to focus on coding full time. Um, but if someone, I, I would really get excited if someone comes and tells me, okay, work on this project if you're looking for free. But I would also be extremely frightened because that's his own business idea. And I, if they are relying on me, it's kind of like I'm responsible for either making it or breaking it. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you overcome that? Uh, that's a risk they're taking. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I would say they had nothing before mm -hmm. and now they have something. Even if yours isn't the final project, even if it becomes a prototype, then at least they have it to show other people, you know, when they're wanting to communicate their ideas. Because the hardest thing for business people to explain to developers is what they want. Mm -hmm. So if you make something for them, at least they can say, I want this. But make it look like Facebook. Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you, you have helped them, you know, even if it, it and I tell you, it won't be the final project of, of what their app ends up as, mm -hmm. unless, you know, mm -hmm. they decide to do something else. Then maybe it's the final. But most things go through lots and lots of change. You know, we've rewritten the code in the year and a half I've been there, you know, three or four times, and things have changed. So, you know, stuff evolves. Mm -hmm. Yours will be, you know, the first evolution, and hopefully many evolutions. So. You know, you're 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 helping them, and they're helping you. It's a mutual relationship. Yeah. But don't worry if you don't know enough, because you know, if they knew how to code, they wouldn't need you. Mm -hmm. But they do need you, so you can help them. Mm -hmm. And you can look for people in these groups to, um, you know, sometimes just come in and you know, there's code nights, and say, hey, I have this project, and if anybody kind of wants to maybe help out with it, if anybody's interested in it. Um, I can say if anybody's looking for projects, um, I have run into a lot of people looking for help um, who are kind of willing to take anything that comes their way. Um, and, you know, as you run into questions, and you will, everybody does, you know, you come to these meetups and stuff where you send any of us an email, anybody can send me an email anytime. And, I mean, I'll do my best to, to walk you through what the solution might look like, or maybe some resources to kind of help you figure it out. Um, you know, and, and Google's always a really good option. Natalia was an art teacher mm -hmm. and just started learning coding on her own and then went freelance last year. Mm -hmm. I could talk all about so, theory. You know, freelance is another thing. There's tons of people on Craigslist yeah. looking for a website. You learn a little bit on WordPress, you can make them a website in half an hour. Mm -hmm. You know, and you pay for it. So if, if any of you want to <coughs> jump off the deep end, you can do that. But um, there's lots of routes and lots of entry points. So just find the one you're comfortable with. And follow people on Twitter. Oh my god. Um, and I say that because <laughs> I mean, everybody in here that I, I follow, and if I don't follow people, I just don't have their Twitter handle, um, post really great resources. Um, so they'll post articles and um, just blog posts. Classes. Yeah, Holly posts every meetup out there. You do, you do a really good job posting. Okay. 
Um, so it's just it's a really great way to yeah, yeah. Twitter. use social media for something that's actually kind of productive. So yeah, I have pictures of lunch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the cool thing. Well, that's all the time we have for tonight. Thank you all for being so patient and asking really great questions. Uh, next week we'll be at Home Away. It's our open half time, so come with your project, or if you need a project, we will give you one. So that's a great time. There's a snacks and a cake, so we have lots of fun just coding. So um, you can be home started out. I'm sorry, you caught that, not home away. We told me not. Oh. <laughs> it used to be at home away, not anymore. You're right, sorry. Thank you, Elza. Elza leads All Girl Hack Night, which is another meetup. Uh, they meet Central Austin, so if people live more up there, their fourth Wednesday? Uh, second Wednesday. Of second Wednesday, Wednesday, yeah. If you look on uh, meetup.com for all girl hack night, yeah, you will find us. And you usually have a speaker. Yeah, I try to find a speaker for every time. Uh, I'm not always successful, but uh, yeah, but we, we, when there is no speaker, we just work on our projects, so it's a hack night. Yes. Yeah. Right. So, there's lots of resources. Girl Develop It is another great meetup in town that has classes usually on the weekends. They're like $20. You can learn HTML and CSS and JavaScript. So, there's lots of resources out there. Just go on and meet up. Google, Google knows. Google knows everything. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>